Hi there, this is Alex with Northwest Archaeometrics and today I'm going to be detailing some of the steps that you need to go through in order to get a 3D scan of a projectile point ready for analysis in the Glimmer application, which is a Morphometrics application. So to get started, we're going to be using the Mesh Lab application. And I'm going to open a scan that was provided by the Pacific Slope Archaeological Laboratory. So while that's loading up, there's four main things that we're going to go over here. The first thing that we need to do with 3D scans that are provided are usually to reduce the uh, face count to a more manageable number. Uh, typically, um, when we get 3D scans from either structured light scanners or uh, laser scanners, they tend to have a lot of extra data points that aren't really needed uh, for the scan. Um, so we need to remove a lot of those in order to get the thing uh, a little bit easier to analyze. After we reduce the face count, we're going to go and align this thing in the bounding box that it is in. We'll set the origin properly as well as getting it aligned in a planar view. And then we're going to look for uh, artifacts in here, digital artifacts that need to be smoothed out a little bit. And we're going to finally end to look for any uh, problems in the scan, such as face misalignments or holes in the, in the mesh or non-manifold edges. And then we'll finish this out by uh, splitting this into two distinct uh, files for Glimmer to analyze. So let's get started. First off, we can see right now that we have about 2.6 million faces here. Uh, I've found that typically with 3D scans, um, usually for a complete model, about 300,000 faces is a good number to shoot for. If it's a really big object, then you'll want some more. So say if you had like a Wenatchee point or something like that, you might want to say double that to six or 700,000. Um, but for most of these projectile points, 300,000 is usually uh, just fine. So to do that, we're going to go to filters and then we're going to go to remeshing, simplification and reconstruction, and then go down to quadric edge collapse decimation. When you go here, it's going to automatically default to a number in the faces. Go ahead and set that to 300,000. And then make sure that you check preserve boundary of the mesh and preserve normal. The rest of these, the defaults should be OK. And click on apply. Now when you do this, um, it can take anywhere from a few seconds, upwards of a minute or two. And it's just dependent upon the size of the scan that you're trying to simplify, as well as the speed of the computer that you're using to do that simplification. And there we go, it's now simplified. We can close this window. And now when we look down at the faces here, we can see that it has 300,000 faces. And if we click and move around, it's much easier to manipulate here in the software. Okay, so now that we've done that, we want to get it properly aligned within the bounding box. So the first thing you can see here is if we go to render, show axes, and then we zoom out, you can see where the origin is set to, and how it's aligned versus the bounding box. So we need to get this point into the center there. So the center of the geometry to the origin of the bounding box. Now you can manually move it around. Uh, however, I found that the easiest way to do this is to go into the filters. And then from here, you go down to normals, curvatures, and orientation. And then go down to move, translate and center. Here all you have to do is put a checkbox next to translate center of B box to the origin and then click on apply and close. Okay now we are centered there however the rotation you can see is incorrect. So what we want is we want the tip of the projectile point to be pointing with the green axis we want the red 
line here, the x to be this way, and then the z should be basically the face. So if you're looking down, it should be uh, face on. So the easiest way to do this first off is I like to orient the sphere to where it basically looks like a plus. And then I hold down the middle mouse button and I click and I drag and I orient the axes to the same as the sphere here. Once you do that, we can start with the rotation. And to do that, you click here on the manipulators tool. And then over here, it says press T to translate, R to rotate, and S to scale. We're going to be totally focused on rotation here. So press R to rotate. And then you want to do one axis at a time. And if you press X, it'll do the X axis. Y, it'll do the Y axis. And Z, it will do the Z axis. Okay, so let's start with X. And here, we're going to basically just kind of eyeball it and try to get it as close as we can. So you move it, then you let go of the left mouse button, and you press Enter, and that locks that in. And then what we can do is we can click up here on the not editing sphere and drag it up and we can see how we're doing. Okay. Now, if you click again on that sphere and then click once on the background, you can now press R to rotate again. And remember to always choose which axis that you want to orient. So this time let's do there's Z and that does that rotation. Enter sphere go up we're going to zoom in a little bit so we can see a little better click on the sphere again click on the background hit r to rotate hit y to do the y-axis and what we want is we want this to be aligned where basically the red arrow is going right through the middle of the projectile point so instead of sticking out from the top and pointing down through it, we want it right through the center, just like that. Now we're going to press enter to lock it in there after we unclick the sphere. And now we're going to look this way. And what we can see here is that the tip is not quite aligned with the y-axis here. However, we have to be careful because these points are never perfectly symmetrical as well. So you basically just have to give it your best shot. So we're going to click on that sphere again so we can modify stuff here. We're going to press R to rotate. We're going to go through these Z axis here. And we're going to choose about there. Okay. Now we're going to look down and we can see that ax axis is okay, but how about the y-axis? And what we want is we want, again, this green arrow to be basically coming out and being straight on both of them. And that looks pretty straight like that. So I'd say that the rotation here is pretty good. Um, once this goes into Glimmer, there will be some additional translation and rotation that's performed there to get it totally down, but for here, this is pretty good. So now we're going to go ahead and click on the Layers dialog, and then we are going to right-click on the name of that layer and choose Freeze Current Matrix. It's going to ask you if you want to do that to all layers or just the one you're working on. Just go ahead and click Apply to do the one you're working on, and then Close. At this point, it is now aligned, and what we want to do is a Save. So you can go ahead and click on the little disk and then we're not doing color here, so I'm going to uncheck color. I'll leave normal, and I'll click OK. That has now saved this file with 300,000 faces, and it's now oriented properly. OK, so now we want to look and see if there's noise on this scan that we want to try to smooth out. Now this one looks pretty good, but we can see there's a little bit of texturing here that is not part of the, the actual artifact. And if we want to smooth that out, you can do some just by clicking on the Mesh Lab Smooth, but I'm going to go ahead and show you how to do this anyway. Um, I don't think that this scan really needs it that much, but I just like to show you the, the uh, process for doing it. So to do that, you go to Filters, and then you go to Smoothing, Fairing, and Deformation, 
and then a toweled in smooth. Now the number of smoothing steps affects how little or how much smoothing that will be performed on this mesh. And I would suggest that you do the minimum in order to make sure that you don't start to really change the morphology of the uh, point. Um, if you're worried about doing too much, instead of doing that, we can always right click on that layer and duplicate it. And that way, if we accidentally mess something up, if we smooth too much, we can always go back to that one and uh, just uh, save that. So again, that was under filters, smoothing, fairing, and deformation, and then Talbin smooth. Here, I usually like to go with either a two or a three. So let's try two smoothing steps and then click apply. And you can see that that right away took out a lot of that noise there, but we still have pretty much all of our surface detail. Okay. So after that, we're going to look for any flaws in the scan, and uh, if we find any, try to repa repair them. Uh, repairing these, sometimes everything can be done in MeshLab. Other times we need to use another application called Mex Mesh Mixer. Um, so let's look here and see, and then maybe we'll go ahead and go through the Mesh Mixer process, even if we don't need to use it here, just so you can see what that looks like. So when I'm doing this, I'm basically looking for anything along the edge that looks like it's not really the original geometry of the uh, artifact. And I can see right here, for instance, that little peak, that is probably not part of the original artifact. You can see another one right here. And a lot of times those are caused by uh, maybe there was a hair on the object that when it was scanned, or maybe there's a a little bit of particulate matter of something, or it could just be that there was, um, it was a little bit more reflective there, caught a reflection, something odd happened in the scan. So you just want to look for things that don't make sense uh, geometrically on the point. And I'm going to go ahead and turn off that show axis as well, just to make it a little bit easier to look at here. To do this, I'm basically using a combination of the middle mouse wheel to pan, if you click and hold down pan and then if you roll the middle mouse it zooms in and out and if you click and hold with the left mouse button you look around like that and this scan is looking pretty good I like to go all the way around the convergent margin here and just basically look for anything where it looks like um, the way to, to describe it would be like a clamshell where you can see a big gap in, in the convergent margin there, which would denote that there was a uh, face misalignment. So another thing to look for is these types of features here where the convergent margin sort of disappears and it just becomes rounded. Um, sometimes if you have too many um, source scans that come in, um, it can cause basically some blurring there. Um, but that also might actually be the actual geometry of the point. So in these types of situations, um, if you have a question, it's always best to have the original artifact, and then you can compare it to the scan to see if the scan is true to life or not there. Oh, yeah, here's a couple more spots. So these little things here, these little protrusions, we'll go ahead and fix those in um, the mesh mag mesh mixer application that I was telling you about earlier. However, except for those little problems, this scan is looking pretty good. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and make sure that we save this, and this time we're going to export it as an STL file. And then we don't need the material ease color encoding, but we are going to choose binary encoding for the encoding here. We'll click on OK to save it. And then we'll go ahead and close Mesh Lab. Now we're going to run Mesh Mixer. And from here, we'll go to Import. And then we'll take that STL file. And we'll open it. And Mesh Mixer is basically a sculpting tool for uh, 3D scan type data. So this allows you to really change the morphometry just as if it was a piece of clay in there. And as such, we need to be really careful when we use it because what we don't want to do is to change the geometry of the point itself and make it not um, 
not actually a representation of the object that we're trying to represent. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go around and look for those little areas where I can tell it's obviously got some kind of problem here on the scan. So for instance, that I can tell right away is not going to be um, a, a uh, typical shape that you would ever see on any kind of uh, stone tool. So you have an, a choice here where you can either try to smooth things out or you can try to actually just delete them all together and then fill it in. When they really stick out far like this, a lot of times it's easiest just to delete those faces and then uh, fill the hole. So I'll show you that first. So if we go to select, um, we can set the size of the brush. So I'm gonna scroll down a little bit and we don't wanna delete any more than we have to. So let's do a little bit smaller. There we go. And then if you just click and drag, and click and drag. And that lump, that might be there, so I'm not going to go too aggressive into it. I'm just going to basically delete the outside ed edges of it. So now that we've done that, I'll just press the delete button, and now we can see we have a hole there. And we'll fix that in a minute. So here's another spot where I can tell that that was just a little dot of something that was uh, put on there during the scan or a little reflective spot. And again, we're just basically going to highlight it and then press the delete key to delete it. And we're creating those holes in the mesh there. Okay, and I believe we saw one on the conversion margin as well. Let's go around the point. There's another one right there. So this time, instead of actually cutting it out, I'll show you how to do the smoothing here. So if you go to Sculpt, Brushes, you can see that we have a whole bunch of different choices for what kind of brush that we want to use. Um, I find that I kind of go and use a lot of these. However, usually the Bubble Smooth and the Shrink Smooth are the two that I use the most. And it's important to remember that the undo, redo hotkeys for Windows work in this application. So Control Z, Control Y undoes and does a redo. So um, if you start to get too far, you can always do that. So, okay, I have the strength set. Now the strength does the level of smoothing here or whatever other sculpting tool you're using. And then the size obviously is the size of it. So I'm now going to click once. And you can see right away that that smoothed that out but it also kind of drew it out a little bit. And I can show that to you by doing an undo and a redo. Undo, redo, undo, redo. So you can see there what it actually did. It raised up these areas and then it lowered down this area. So now we say, we, we should ask ourselves, is it the right amount? Did it bulge it out too much or is it not enough? In this case, I can tell that it's not following the contour of that flake scar, so I'm going to go ahead and smooth it down a little bit more. So with all of these sculpting tools, if you hold down the control key while you click, it does the opposite. So when I was clicking there, it was actually drawing things out. If I hold control now, it's going to push it in when I click. And I'm just going to click a few times here just to kind of smooth it out a little bit. And now I'm going to pan around. And we can look and see how good or bad we did by just doing some undos. So that's what it looked like when we started. And that's what it looked like when we finished. So that you can tell is still keeping with the contour of those flake scars. I don't think that we're changing the underlying shape very much, but getting rid of that one little, little surficial problem. Now we're going to continue to go around, look for any other issues. There's one more there. Let's go ahead and fix this guy. And again, with these that really stick out a lot, a lot of times it's easier to just select them and delete them and then have the software fill in the hole flat. There we go. Okay, and I think we've gone all the way around. So now we'll look at this face. That face looks good. 
Then we'll look at this face. This face looks pretty good. So let's go ahead and now fill those holes. To do that, what we do is go to Edit, I'm sorry, Analysis, Inspector, and then in Inspector, choose Smooth Fill and just click on Auto Repair. And at that point, the places that have been repaired will show up as a different color and you can just see if the fixes look correct or not. And those all look pretty darn good to me. How about this one over here? Where are we? There we are. Yeah, I think that this is actually looking pretty good now. So now that we're at this point, we can go ahead and export it again. And we're just going to keep that STL and just overwrite it. And then go ahead and close Mesh Mixer. And now we're going to go back to Mesh Lab one more time. And in Mesh Lab this time, let's go ahead and reopen that STL file. One thing to keep in mind with Mesh Lab as well is that um, it's really easy to accidentally close the project, but not the mesh or close the project and the mesh and not have a project open. And then if you try to import the mesh, it'll be grayed out. So if you ever see import mesh is grayed out, it just means that you need to create a new project. Then we can choose import mesh, go to our desktop and open up the STL file. We click on okay. And now we can see that it is properly aligned in the center of our screen when we first open it. And if we go to render color per mesh, it gets rid of that really bright white. Okay, so at this point, the next thing that we need to do now is to get this split into two individual faces that are in the same coordinate space, um, but separate, so we can then put them into Glimmer for analysis. Uh, to do that, the easiest way I've found is actually in Mesh Lab with the Paint tool. So if we basically just take the hardness and the size and maximize them both, then you get the, the point perfectly um, planar view here so it's flat and then you just paint one side of the mesh black. This is selecting everything that is facing you basically with a black color. Then we can close the paint tool and we go to layers and we're going to duplicate it with that black coloring. Okay so now we can go to filter, selection, and select faces by color. And then we click on, it'll just default to black, so you click on apply and then close. It's important to remember which layer that you're on here because sometimes you'll be on the other layer and you won't know and then you won't understand what's going on at a later point. So we on this layer, on the original one, we have now selected everything that's black. Now we're going to click on the delete uh, the current set of faces and all of the vertices that are surrounded by those faces. If you just press the delete key, it's not going to get rid of the vertices, it's just going to get rid of the faces and then when you export it as an XYZ file, it will um, have everything and it'll mess up your Glimmer analysis. Okay, so now we deleted those and you can see now it looks like everything's still there, but if I uncheck this one, we only have half. Okay, now we are going to go to filter select, select faces by color, apply again, okay. However, this time we're then going to go to filter selection, invert selection, apply, close, and note that we are on that other layer now. Now we're going to go ahead and click on delete the set of uh, selected faces and all the vertices again, and now we just have the top half. And then if we view the other layer, we just have the bottom half. So we have a perfectly split projectile point now for Glimmer analysis. So the final step here is to save them. So you can go to File, Export Mesh As, and then just label them side A and B. So you do underscore A, for instance. 
And note that it always wants to default to a PLY file, but for our uses, we usually use an STL. And I like to save it first as an STL, so we have an STL mesh of each side, and you don't need color information. And then I save it again, so export mesh as, and this time I choose an XYZ. And note that it keeps the A, which is what you want, dot XYZ. Save, and we uncheck the normal box. And we click OK. Now we just replicate that on this other layer here. So file, export mesh as, change it to STL, select A, and then you can change that to B, so you don't have to type in the rest of your file name. Click save, you uncheck your color, click OK. And we do that one last time with XYZ. Save, uncheck normal, click OK. And you are now ready to go ahead and put this into Glimmer for the next part of your morphometric analysis.